Hello there and welcome back to the Agassino Zynga show with me your host Agassino Zynga and this is episode number 275 that's 275 of the Agassino Zynga show how you doing how you feeling great good to know if it's your first time check out the show via youtube you know what to do smash that like hit subscribe and of course leave me a comment down below with your thoughts feelings and suggestions and as per usual i'll read them ignore them and like the ones that i like and if you're listening via the podcast i'd be share any five star review would definitely help the show go a long way so if you could do that and spare a little five minutes to do that i'd be much appreciated i've got already 12 reviews on there some more between now and the end of the month will definitely help to get the show boosted and of course support via patreon to get patreon on new content bonus episodes all on there make sure you subscribe at patreon.com for just agassino for little as one pound equivalent of one dollar per month you get access to all that bonus information all that bonus content only on patreon so make sure you subscribe and you jump on there don't delay get involved right now Oof, how's it going how's it feeling um on my end pretty decent all things considered i think the other day or maybe over the weekend it was a little bit more of a dour occasion more so because i, I ended up reading too much you know too many news articles which ends up it's a twofold isn't it right it's a double-edged sword you read a couple of news articles and you can be fairly informed maybe more so informed than your average citizen to what's actually going on in the world right now but also when you go that's that little bit too far you end up also being in a point where everything just looks like doom and gloom and after i read a couple of things pertaining to what's happening in the netherlands and stuff happening in ireland and scotland i was like oh my god man it's not really looking good for us going forward and in terms of the lifting of the next phase of restrictions it just all seemed a bit like doom and gloom i was really feeling a little bit I wouldn't say negative, but just a little bit more on the cautious side of things. But then as per usual with this sort of affair and this times we're living in, after you worry for a brief hour, maybe a day, you then come to slowly to the realization that it doesn't really matter how much you worry. Things are going to go the way they're going to go, regardless of what you do or say. You might as well just kind of prepare yourself mentally and somewhat physically to whatever outcome happens. And that's how that's really how you basically go about it. It's a little bit of a stoic principle in terms of like understanding that shit things will always happen to you in one way shape or the other and the only real thing you can really control is your reaction to it that really is it especially now concerning you know you turn on the news and it doesn't stop with all the negativity and um the strife and the struggle you know imagine during this tough times people in cuba are suffering they're going through an uprising you know haiti's president was by all accounts murdered by some foreign american agents it's just a whole complete shit service situation you don't even have to touch what's going on in central europe it's absolutely bleak out there but as per usual you know this world or this life that we get given to us this kind of precious time we have on this earth there's always like a little bit of a glimmer a little bit of a shiny twink at the end of the tunnel and for us in the uk it finally got confirmed over monday or yeah yesterday as in monday um about the final phase of the restrictions being lifted and i gotta be honest man this legitimately might be the happiest time or the happiest day um of this entire time maybe the happiest was probably when the first set of restrictions got lifted and people could go out side because there was a brief period where there was a kind of a curfew basically imposed but it wasn't really a stringent curfew what they did in the uk is that they prevented some bars and pubs from opening after a certain time i think it was after 10 p.m which inevitably forced people to go home because it was cold outdoors but um so that was a good time when that kind of got lifted and when lads got to parks and stuff that was a really good time because you could feel for once there was a little bit of a happiness in the atmosphere people weren't as negative as they were prior but this final confirmation on the 12th was definitely the date that i was most nervous about i think a lot of people in the kind of excitement of things reopening didn't really pay attention to the date of the 12th which was when they were going to get it confirmed because so far in the uk when they um kind of lift the restrictions there's always like a two-week window they kind of announced them two weeks in advance and then the week before the restrictions are meant to be lifted they didn't do another review to make sure that they can go through with it and then you know it kind of gets enacted the following week i'm assuming that week ahead of time is to make sure that they can adjust things in parliament and to give businesses and whatever a chance to you know um amend things again a week isn't enough time but it's better they do a week than they do two days or on the day so they're trying to kind of you know um rewrite that wrong because i think in the early parts of lockdown there was a lot of kind of um drastic u-turns being taken on the day or sometimes a couple of days before the announcement was already made so there is definitely um a good approach in the way they do things now but it's definitely good to see stuff 
have um, reopened or on the way to be reopening. I can only imagine what people in that sector, especially in nightlife and clubs and bars and stuff, must be feeling like. Um, there must be a bit of a bittersweet because for sure there's a couple of places that probably haven't been able to survive, um, especially because of the first set of lockdowns was meant to happen or the first lifting was meant to happen, I think, on the 23rd or 22nd or something of June. So it's been a complete, it's been nearly a month since then. Some places probably haven't been able to hang on, but those that have, have a chance to somehow, you know, be able to rectify the situation, put money in their pockets, you know, put smiles on people's faces, give people jobs again, all that sort of stuff. So it's really good to see all around. So, so it's courtesy of the BBC, it says England lockdown rules to end on 19th PM confirms says it means that almost all legal restrictions on social contact will be removed but the prime minister said it was vital to proceed with caution warning its pandemic is not over the peak of the current wave is not expected uh before mid-august and could lead between 1000 2000 hospital admissions per day according to government scientists so central estimates from modelers advising the government also show that the covid deaths are expected to be between 100 and 200 per day at the peak although there is a large amount of uncertainty God damn. So the numbers don't really correlate to um, allowing us to be outdoors, if you're completely honest. But we're in a position now where there isn't really a good or bad. There really, there really isn't a great time to reopen things, right? Everything is kind of bad. You're basically kind of hoping that it's not as bad as your models kind of tell you. But the theory is if we try to wait until September, which is what some people in SAGE are advising, because September might be the time where we can effectively or not effectively, but we can hypothetically um vaccinate the vast majority of the population it still is not you know covering everybody because you still need to you know make sure that everyone is up for taking it and everyone is going to take it but for those who are at risk you can cover the majority of them i think up to 80 percent by september but then you know boris raises a good point if it's flu season and we're meant to hit a peak at the end of august begin september there's no guarantee that if we do hold out until then the world will be or the country itself will be in a better place for us to basically go out as per normal so you're kind of hoping this head start is it's going to do something i don't know what it's going to do i don't know what the real thinking behind it again no policy maker don't really give a shit want to just be outdoors but it does kind of make you think this doesn't really make any sense really if you think about it but again the desire to go outdoors makes you want to suspend your logical mind and you're not really thinking about it too much i'm sure people are doing it but if the numbers keep going up and again forget what you know some people are like oh it's about deaths not cases it's about deaths not okay cool but numbers of deaths are still going up they haven't gone down we're not in like low double digits in deaths we're still quite high um you know of, of course cases are you know expounding the stories of people who have vaccines getting the covid still there's all these anomalies that are popping up so there is no clear running a runway for us to approach but maybe this is the best possible scenario all things considered the article continues it says earlier the health secretary told the house of commons cases could reach up to a hundred thousand a day later in the summer but he did not believe that this would put the unsusta unsustainable pressure on nhs he said vaccinations had created a positive wall sorry a protective wall which would mean it could um, withstand a summer wave says sajiv javid um boris johnson later told downing street press conference that obvious uh, sorry that coronavirus continues to carry risk for you and your family we simply cannot revert instantly from Monday July to it as life as it was before COVID the Prime Minister added that he hoped that the roadmap will be irreversible but in order to have that it's also got to be cautious approach so the irreversible rhetoric has kind of disappeared which is sensible I think prior Boris was like oh, it's irreversible we can't if we open up we're not going to go backwards but unfortunately like you know we wanted it's one thing it's kind of weird isn't it right they're a conservative government but they're quite populist in how they go about things right they sort of kind of wait to see what the public sentiment is before they make a decision so it's no surprise that he's not really kind of pinning his flag or putting his you know stamping his foot down and saying this is the day we're gonna go with this and we're not going back he's sort of kind of covering all these bases opening up despite the numbers being you know a little bit concerning also basically telling us to advising us to still wear a mask and when we go outdoors saying it's not reversible saying that it's a cautious approach saying that they're gonna reintroduce the lockdowns again if the numbers kind of go the other way he's done that thing that you're not meant to do when you gamble where you basically put your money on literally every Everybody, which makes it which ends up making you no money you have to kind of put your money on someone right at least one person maybe a minimum of two um but you know what can you do going forward the savage javid thing is good it's, it's funny though and ever since he's taken over from what's his face hancock 
it's been a pretty easy run up for a minute because essentially all you have to do is just be a little bit more steadfast in your ideals that things should be reopened and life should go back to normal and people are generally going to think you're better than the other guy right politics is weird like that isn't it you just have so much time to collect data and to find out where the other person's gone wrong and the moment you step into their shoes you just do the opposite of what they've done or you do a little bit more of what they did that people liked that they didn't kind of top kind of double down on and then suddenly you've kind of won loads of fans but anyway it continues while virtually all restrictions will be lifted some guidance will remain for example the legal requirement to wear face coverings in some enclosed spaces will be removed but javid said that they were still expected and recommended in crowded indoor areas nightclubs will also be allowed to reopen open for the first time since march 2020 so it's been effectively a year it feels longer so it's not been that long it's been a year and a couple of months but it feels much longer than that. i don't know why specifically but it might have to do with the play graves because we've seen other people being outdoors and celebrating and dancing around when they probably shouldn't it's probably made us feel like there's been a lot more going on than it has but in the grand scheme of things not really there was that brief period in time last summer when berlin had some events switzerland was doing a couple austria doing a couple obviously parts of um eastern europe or central europe and um, we're doing a couple too but for the most part everyone's kind of been locked down of course you know america's sort of on its own little tangent over there it continues says there'll no longer be limits on how many people can meet and the one meter plus distancing rule will be removed so there's going to be people absolutely grinding up your ass in supermarkets now the the days of like I, I quite enjoyed that maybe i was in the minority but i enjoyed the fact that people gave you space in places where usually people don't respect your personal space right <laughs> it's quite nice to have that um so be prepared for you know a bunch of people standing right beside you as you go and kind of pick up your avocados it continues but nightclubs and other venues with large crowds so-called domestic vaccine passports as a matter of social responsibility the prime minister said yeah about that don't think a lot of people are going to do that i think a lot of clubs especially are probably veering on the eyes on the side of personal responsibility they're veering on the lives of, they're veering on the side of liberty freedom and all that stuff and i think after preventing these places from opening for the best part of a year it really feels um somewhat it really feels somewhat kind of i don't know there is something quite disrespectful about demanding these places to then try to enforce a vaccination passport certificate system for entry right um I've I've come to the conclusion or I've kind of argued for the longest time that I think a lot of people will be in for quite a rude awakening in terms of the numbers of people that are going to go out clubbing in the UK. I think the polls recently where people basically voted and said, oh, we don't want clubs to reopen. You think they're menaced the society with COVID rampant. There is, it feels like there's a collective sort of changing in consciousness when it comes to nightclubs and all that sort of stuff. I think because it was kind of seen as the enemy of progress, right? All these people going out and doing play graves, illegal raves. I don't know if people kind of feel have changed their stance on it so it wouldn't surprise me if a lot of the places that are meant to be opening will be a lot emptier than people actually assume they would be and if that's the case these clubs will need every single punter that they can to walk in you know they, they're not in the business of being able to turn away um, patrons um, especially after being again without business for a year so to demand that from places is really unfair but i think it's nothing to worry about because i don't think a lot of places will enforce it they said it continues this would allow people to show that they are double jabbed have a negative test result or have the natural immunity after recovering from covid using an nhs app in guidance published after the press conference the government said it was revert it would reserve the right to make the certification mandatory in certain venues if necessary in the future that's completely fine it makes complete sense no one's going to abide by it though it continues government guidance to work from home where possible will be lifted but the ministers are encouraging a gradual return to the workplace mr javid also said people should act with personal responsibility and try to meet people outside for sure if you're working in a place where you're meant to be working where you've been working from home now enjoy the last few weeks or a couple of weeks of freedom because more than likely than not i think a lot of places unless you're like a really progressive forward-thinking starter by going to demand stuff to go back into the office I, I just think people have had enough of being i think it's twofold people have had enough of being at home in general i think by and large if, whether it's kind of you know people in the uh, management or people just working as employees i think they definitely want to be back within their staff or sit in a kind of office with fellow in colleagues and having a chat with a cover machine people miss all that sort of stuff that work gossip stuff it doesn't really bang the same way through slack and whatnot or microsoft teams so definitely there's going to be a resurgence of people coming back there but i just think in general for the kind of economy to bounce back there needs to be people commuting back and forth to metropolitan you know, city areas to go work in we works and other co-working spaces because if not 
you know, I don't know how the economy is going to bounce back. Like those people popping into prayer in the morning or Starbucks or Costas or Eat, they are responsible for a lot of people's jobs. They're responsible for a lot of money kind of passing hands in and around that area. So for sure, there's going to be a somewhat, I would say, there's going to be some very interesting outside influences putting pressure on people who own companies or buildings or whatever it may be to put pressure on ministers to then get people to go back into your office for sure so definitely enjoy your bits of freedom now but don't think it's going to last forever and if it can last forever or the only way it should be last forever is if you somehow negotiate into your contract if not then don't expect it to go on for a long time um, unless you're working in a place like Facebook or what some other you know forward thinking tech startup place uh, Mr. Javid also said people should they said the requirements of self isolate if you have contacted um contacted by nhs stress and test and trace will remain in place until august 16th when it'll be relaxed if someone tests positive for virus they'll, they'll still be legally required to self-isolate while well, due to review its restriction on the 15th of july while scott inspected to move to zero on the 19th um of course um lift legal most legal limits by 9th of august and northern line is due to ease on the 26th so we're quite we're going quite gung-ho we're the um, we're, we're kind of putting our foot to the metal everyone else looks like they're kind of being a little bit more cautious especially scotland they're really really taking their sweet ass time to reopen things the nhs test and trace app i'm assuming a lot of people once the world reopens are probably going to end up deleting it um the ordinance we have here to wear masks in enclosed areas i think is still a good idea i think that one of the best things to come out of covid is the norm is a normalization of people wearing face masks right there was a period in time where you'd go to an airport or some kind of you know busy metropolitan area and you see people from asian countries wearing face marks and generally they were kind of met with i wouldn't say derision but some sort of confusion you didn't really get what these guys were doing like do they know something that we don't it just would you know it just kind of weirdly upset you discombobulate you kind of throw you off but obviously now with covid people are a lot more welcoming and open to it so seeing somebody with masks doesn't necessarily you know don't bat an eyelid at all and i think if anything going forward in terms of being on public transport and being on planes and stuff especially in the uk because our public transport is terrible there is no air conditioning so if there's a way to kind of minimize the amount of gunk that you're inhaling into your respiratory system then the better but i think definitely for planes and stuff and just generally as a courtesy because i think you know that's something that we kind of missed in the confusion of wearing a face mask during covid was the mask was less so a kind of prevention and a cure for making sure you don't get the virus and more so a kind of weird meta signaling thing that we were kind of all in this together and you know if i wear one you wear one then hopefully it will limit the spread you know it kind of had some um signaling um, messages or kind of messaging tied into it right so i'm assuming i would hope going forward people who are ill who decide you know those kind of, those psychos who have fevers before they go on holiday or who are openly sneezing with their mouth open without covering their mouth or anything will hopefully decide to put on a mask on if they're not feeling well and not put their other you know um there are other kind of people on the plane at risk from you know catching a cold or anything unnecessarily especially at work at work i understand it because there is this weird especially in the uk people seem to have a real big hang up on calling in sick they feel as if they're like you know might get fired or whatever it may be or sometimes the boss tells you without telling you that if you do call in too many times sick that you're going to be in jeopardy of losing your job so people tend to kind of be a little bit um a little bit careless with their sickness and kind of coming coughing sneezing and shit so hopefully that will continue and people will just end up being like you know what i've got i'm sick i'm gonna put this mask on um everyone else back away and protect yourself so definitely looking forward to stuff like that changing going forward but i'm just happy to see it finally come to an end on the 19th and we can come back to some semblance of normality i beg you i bloody bloody beg you and then to continue that we obviously have this um main story coming out from the 19th was this which says nightclubs and large venues are advised to ask for vaccine passports which obviously seems insane considering the you know the decision quite adamantly that was put forward i think a few months ago that there would be no covid vaccine passports needed but now i guess because of the variants and because of all these other countries such as israel and, and the like that have had a real big high adoption rate adoption whatever it's called right take up in terms of getting a vaccine they've still been ravaged by the new variant so there is no it doesn't look like there's a real surefire way to make sure that you kind of get away from being in a situation where this virus is running rampant it seems like unfortunately um 
to some extent if you just open the doors and allow people to go back outdoors and you know congregate and share fluid and bodily heat in enclosed areas no matter what how good ventilation is people are still going to catch this virus it's somehow ridiculously contagious in that respect but you're just gonna have to you know kind of bite the bullet in that respect but the requiring of nightclubs and venues to then check for people for covid passports is pretty insane does that mean you're going to what hire more security staff at the front of these venues venues that haven't again haven't been open for a year are then going to require to employ more people to check for passports specifically does that person need training are all passports made equal like it's just it's just unnecessary um if anything and especially in a country like the uk where we don't necessarily have a good relationship with door picking right i think if this will maybe might work in other parts of europe like berlin for instance where there is a bit of a culture of like okay even if you've got the money it doesn't mean you can come in right it's a little bit like you know you have to kind of match the scene and the vibe what they're about blah blah blah, blah. but in the uk for the most part people kind of respond very negatively to the idea of being told they can't come in because they don't have this or that or because they don't look as cool as that or that people pick up a bit of a stink and sometimes it can veer on the side of racism and whatever and discrimination but we don't really have a good relationship with that so just imagine you know after there's the late there's kind of the, the barrier of entry based on your skin color the barrier of entry based on your gender the barrier of entry based on your sexual orientation and now suddenly there's another barrier based on your vaccine status and why should you share that with the nightclub that you're going to attend right why should they have that part of your medical history um or why should they be privy to that part of your medical information just for you to be able to dance and you know do a couple of shitty bumps of care in the toilet it doesn't make any sense really from for all intense purposes but again we digress the article itself says the following confirming that the most covid vaccine rules in england will be lifted on 9th of july health secretary um Sa sajid javid encourage event organizers to require attendees to show so-called vaccine passports they show a person has natural immunity after contracting virus that they are double jabbed or tested negative they're available through the nhs app right they make it seem quite simple and whatever it may be but again not everyone i don't think everyone's going to be open for having an nhs app on their phone they're going to be open with sharing their deals with strangers and they just won't be open to kind of share be, they won't be open to the idea of having to share your vaccine status in order for you to dance it just seems a bit insane especially now considering that we've had a year without clubs people have had a year to kind of reconcile or figure out an alternate solution to getting their dance on without the records without the conventional nightclubs people have other options that they won't be as don't give it wrong people will still be bummed if they get turned away from the club but it's not it's not to be on envelope we, we found out how to have fun around our own we found out how to have fun in parks we found out how to have fun outdoors the consumers i think mindset and kind of demands and preferences that's kind of changed i feel like um maybe irreversibly so who knows but i think they're gonna have a hard time enforcing this sort of thing but i think in most places won't even enforce it he said however the government's guidance is not mandatory meaning organizers would not be legally required to follow it great speak on dining street press conference Boris johnson said as a matter of social responsibility we urge in nightclubs and other venues with large crowds to make use of the nhs covid pass which shows proof and vaccination a recent negative test on natural immunity as a means of entry talking about um a matter of social responsibility don't you think this isn't other thing governments right the social responsibility thing what's his what's his name the ugly dude right who the bald one who went driving to test his eyesight social responsibility would have been like you know what because we're at a pivotal kind of point in covid and we want to make sure everyone is going by the rules we're gonna to have to fire you just so we can send a message that we're all kind of in this together and there's not one rule for us one rule for everybody else the same would apply to the hancock situation right with him cheating on his wife obviously with that assistant um in the government building bloody blah, blah 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 obviously breaking restrictions and contact things whatever right just you know forget the ethics and morality of it all but just in terms of a signal as a kind of a case for social responsibility wouldn't you say firing those two people would have been a better way to go about things to kind of send a message as opposed to telling people now once things have been lifted oh this is your social responsibility to put on a mask when you're in a nightclub somewhere it doesn't sometimes i feel like 
there's so many easy wins that these governments could easily get, but they always seem to fumble it at the line, always. In a written guidance published after the press conference, the government said it reserves the right to force venues to require people to show their vaccine passport. And of course, you know, you've got the app here that tells you how to, you can download it and stuff. But like I said, I don't think a lot of places will enforce it. I think it's going to be met with a lot of deaf ears for the most part. Or I think what will generally happen is that um, one or two clubs will try to do it. They'll do it for the first couple of hours. It'll be absolutely pandemonium outside, people screaming and complaining. And then the manager or whoever's on, in charge that day will come down and make a second decision and say you know what fuck this let's go forward or the bouncers himself will be like you know what i've got enough to deal with on top of having to deal with people's kind of medical documents to get kind of bound this just doesn't make any sense so for sure this is definitely something that's going to be and that's going to end up just being one of those things that just gets you know swept under the rug i think going forward um and then again um have a little prayer or keep the your our dutch brothers and sisters in your thoughts because bloody hell man i can only imagine what this must feel like. This is courtesy of RA. It's a Dutch festivals and nightclubs shut for another month. The U-turn decision comes less than two weeks after nightlife was allowed to resume, right? I think it's one thing not having a possibility to dance or forget dancing, just do what you want, like in terms of freedom of movement and going places and holidays, whatever it may be. But I don't know how I would be or how I would feel if I was given that freedom and then it got taken away two weeks later. I think that happens earlier on in covid when the gyms reopened they opened for like a month or like two weeks i think and then the spike happened or the surge or whatever it may be called was it called spike surge whatever the wave second wave third wave happened and suddenly they had to close again but i can't you know gyms are going to get wrong. it's bad still it's something i've kind of really been happy that have been reopened and it's definitely helped my overall mental health during this whole period of time being in, indoors but I can't imagine having festivals and nightclubs reopen for a brief period of time and then shut again. I think I featured one, right? Dixon playing at that um, venue called Ijland or Iceland, wherever it's called, right? And then suddenly, imagine being at that party, right? Seeing Dixon play, one of his best sets so far that I've seen him play throughout the entirety of COVID. It's, he looked like he enjoyed himself the most at that venue too. And then to suddenly be in a situation where now you can't go back to that place for what? Another three months, four months, five months, six months? <sighs> I can only I can only imagine what that must feel like. So it says the following festivals and nightclubs in Netherlands will continue or sorry will be closed until August fourteenth. A sharp increase in COVID nineteen cases, particularly among the under thirties, has led to a U turn in the Dutch reopening plan. As Dutch news reports, cases have increased sevenfold since nightlife reopened on June twenty sixth. Prime Minister Mark Root or Rutte or Rotte, have you pronounced that? Held a press conference last Friday, July 9th, to announce a decision allowing seven thousand new cases. Sorry, following seven thousand new cases um, reported in the last twenty four hours prior. Jesus Christ! And again, our cases are estimated to be about one thousand to two thousand right so don't get me wrong it's a few thousand off but it's not far <laughs> so let's just enjoy the time that you have enjoy the whatever freedoms you have from the 19th but don't look too far ahead and it continues here so see venues will be allowed to continue to admitting guests who can show a negative pass though the midnight curfews will be reimposed curfews you know imagine going from being in a club to going to have a curfew two weeks later <laughs> hang me kill me push me off a bridge the new rules also require tests to be um, within 24 hours of entry not 40 as was the case previously night come to festivals aren't permitted to open at all a cabinet decision will be made on august the 13th as to whether the restrictions will be lifted the rules have already led to the postponement of events such as dick mantle and a dick mantle statement felt a little bit def like it felt so defeated or deflated it felt as if like Whoever was writing that was legitimately crying into their keyboard. Like they felt really, really tore up because, you know, they were talking about how small their team was and how even though they were given short notice for the kind of, you know, the allow, the, the, the put, even though they were given a short notice to allow this festival to happen this year, they still tried to make it happen. And then, of course, they got pulled underneath from their rugs. The, the rug got pulled underneath from their feet. And now they're in a position where it sort of feels like that statement from Dick Mantle was like, oh, we don't even know if we can survive going forward, right? Do you know what I mean? But we're going to try and do right by our kind of community and the scene. But they generally were super, super bummed. And I can, again, I can only imagine because with the festival, it's not a club night. You kind of have to postpone it for the following year. 
you can't just postpone it for a couple of months later down in the year because there's so much work that goes into setting it up even if it is in your home country you still have to bring in stuff bring in djs get them all confirmed it's a lot of work that goes into it so and again if you've got a small team you're pushing everyone to their brink it's just i don't know i'd imagine a lot of those things you probably need to have some sort of a good atmosphere for it to go well i don't know for it to be organized in the right way but regardless man keep our dutch ravers and clubbers in your thoughts because they are going through it man they are going through it and then there's this wild story courtesy of the north korea herald it says uh, say goodbye to gangnam style treadmill running for the next two weeks um some level four restriction re uh, remains so right this is a nutty nutty article it says the following south korea's various authorities are asking those in the greater Seoul area to give up high speed running on treadmills and fast dance music groups in exercise and fitness clubs as they worry that the intense workouts could exasperate the spread of covid19 during this most challenging wave to date Right. So somehow they've kind of been able to correlate the spiking cases with young people excreting, you know, um, copious amounts of sweat as I am right now. Um, and that's somehow, of course, leading to the virus um, speak peaking and doing an absolute madness over there in the Korea. And now they're kind of preventing you from dancing to music over what 120 BPM, it feels like or something like that. It's maddening in it where we're at in the world right now. The restrictions under the strictest level of the 40th system now require many fitness classes clubs and users to revise their plans or else face fines the health authorities have also come under mounting public criticism over their rules that people are calling nonsensical and ridiculous which they kind of are to be completely honest starting monday korea started enforcing the most restrictive social distancing measures in seoul um each how you say that in Cheon and gyeongji Gyeongji province for the next two weeks in an effort to overcome the record daily COVID-19 case numbers. Private gatherings of three or more are banned from 6 p.m. to 5 a.m. in those areas. The private messaging, sorry, the private gatherings of five or more are banned throughout the rest of the day. Violators face fines of up to 100,000 won, which is $87. Not that much really, isn't it, for breaking the rules. Um, while the general contentions of such rules are acceptable to many, the public isn't so sure whether some of these details clauses especially those dealing with indoor sports facilities are really helpful in curbing the spread under under level four rules taking showers within fitness club premise, premises is prohibited what taking showers in fitness club premises is prohibited only a limited number of users are allowed in each area of time people are what smashing each other too much in the showers right? those grander folks man they're going crazy in there so at the same time the running speed on treadmills is capped to six kilometers per hour music played on group exercise classes at fitness clubs cannot exceed 120 beats per minute they must be a really fit nation in general because you know i've got a local religious center my way and whenever i ramp up my running speed to like a high nine or low 10 you always see people looking at you like you're an absolute freak right trying to run that fast on a treadmill but and you know because most people don't try and exert themselves to that extent people most people just kind of get it at so a really steep incline and just kind of do that weird walk thing where you're holding onto the thing and watching your tv series so to have people the vast majority of people in that gym running running over 100 what 20 beats per minute is just maddening in it um, music sorry or running over six kilometers per hour is just insane oh yeah it says it here right the bpm music played at group classes um at fitness clubs cannot exceed 120 bpm so all those um new kind of you know what they call it whatever that hardcore thing is they're playing in berlin at that moment all those new hot djs and stuff can't be playing any music in these sort of places because they are not ramping with it it says there that means the famous pop styles songs like gangnam style 132 bpm cannot be played the funny thing about gangnam style being 132 bpm there's a lot of really sick tunes that are 132 bpm or 130 135 you could legitimately if you wanted to mix gangnam style to into just about every genre i think has a song that's around 130 135 it's a flipping terrible track right it's like it only works the only, the only thing that works about it is maybe the opening verse and the chorus or maybe just the chorus alone um after that it kind of gets a little bit redundant um it kind of reminds you of that. What's that song with Rihanna and, and Khaled? It sounded really good the first time you heard it. And then the more you hear it, the more annoying it kind of gets overall. It's just a mad one. It says, yeah, I don't know what's more worry. 
quote here, I don't know what's more to worry about. These droplets when everyone wears masks without exception, said a 32-year-old office worker based in Seoul who goes to the gym almost every day after work. He said, they require us to wear face masks while working out, check temperatures before they enter, provide our phone numbers, and I've already followed these rules every day. And now they want to stop us running and listen to ballads? Very, very true. Imagine running. That you, to be fair, I'm one of those sickos. I'm not sure if people are the same. I listen to a lot of R&B when I'm in the gym. Maybe it's the calming nature of it, but I've been absolutely banging, banging, banging that Brandy album still to this day. Snow Allegra, obviously the recent album that dropped. But I have a tendency to listen to a softer, slower music when I'm lifting heavy, excessive weights. Obviously, when I move to doing an like actual wad, like a workout kind of hit thing, I tend to kind of ramp up a bit. But imagine running to a ballad, like, you know, K-pop style ballads, right? Croning, singing you know whistling into the wind sort of stuff it seems wild um jang said many of his friends who also exercise at a fitness club found these measures illogical and excessive and they had discussed how to adjust their workout routine said hardcore radio sorry hardcore cardio has marked the start and the end of my daily exercise routine and now they want me to run slower but they also asked us to leave in two hours what do they want from us does the government want me to get fat and give up a lifestyle for the sake of these dumb rules it, that's the one place where they don't accept um, not looking in, the, in your not being in your best shape possible in, in Korea these guys are what working out two hours a day more than two hours a day it feels like because he's complaining um, he goes in the morning and in the day right because your hardcore cardio has marked the start and the end of my daily exercise routine so he goes in the morning and in the day to get his um to get himself primed and ready for his um work whatever he has to do if it's nine to five and um yeah he doesn't like it in fact you know you can't fit into those skinny trousers or those wide pant trousers you know being a 38 waist it doesn't look the same authorities have defended the restrictions of fitness clubs saying that fast music and strenuous cardio exercise could generate more re re respiratory droplets and cause the virus to spread further this is what we knew at the beginning right we knew that this was the case we knew the idea was that you want to prevent people from being indoors because they're going to spread it um you know um, the droplets and stuff and it's highly contagious and all that malarkey so this isn't new news but it's just mad to think that at this point they're still kind of um taking these really draconian methods in order to kind of um get some control under with the situation it feels a bit weird it feels a little bit backwards but you know again you have to kind of pray for your folk over there in korea i'm not gonna read the entire thing but definitely check it out mad news mad news indeed we continue here. What else are we going to move on from there? Oh, yeah, this is a good one. So the fallout from the Conor McGregor and Dustin Poirier fight number three still continues. Conor is posting up some weird, you know, pictures and clips, um, the weird tweets. I think he posted a couple of pictures now. We've got Dustin Poirier and his daughter. I don't know what that was all about. He's speaking about how you need me. I'm the bad guy, the, whatever. Tr trying to lean into this whole devil antichrist sort of like you know um villain protagonist sort of like persona when you know deep down it's not really him it's sort of similar to the colby covington thing where colby was obviously kind of put his back was against the wall because he felt like he wasn't getting the shots or the opportunities that he needed just being a good fighter so he kind of adopted this sort of like um captain maga persona and of course it definitely ended up working for him but it, it in, the, in the process it kind of ostracized him from everybody else in terms of his fellow fighters and what not because they saw because they felt as if like he kind of started to embody that persona in real life too which is you know we could say what's right and what's wrong about that later on but it feels as if like connor is doing a little bit of revisionist um transformation now it feels like because he obviously lost in a very upsetting manner um because some people would argue i, I wouldn't personally because i'd say a fight is a fight you don't know what's gonna happen until it happens but some people have argued that because it was a 10-8 round for dustin poirier because he controlled kind of on the ground for a majority of that first round especially towards the end that it was m looking most likely that Co dustin wouldn't allow connor to just stand him up all in that all, all fight and that he was going to take him down if he did take him down there's only one winner because um connor's ground game or you know he's got his game from the from off his back is pretty crap for the most part even you know he tried to sink in that guillotine that didn't really work and a lot of people are saying that was a bit to get an error in judgment but most people are saying that you know the only outcome was that was that connor dustin was going to win if that's the case and if connor maybe deep down thinks it was the case but isn't willing to admit it maybe this explains why he's going on this weird tirades in order to kind of somehow um make it make sense in his head i think he's dropped now to seventh in the rankings as well 
which I think is a little bit generous still. I don't think he's a top 10 guy at all. I think the people underneath him would definitely beat him on their day. Um, he obviously still has a possibility of putting people's lights out with that left hand and spinning attacks and stuff. You know, he's kind of uh, obviously an entertaining guy to watch in the octagon, but this isn't necessarily a skill thing for me. This is definitely more so a thing of like, you know, the guy's just wealthy beyond any kind of logic, any kind of... um any kind of manner that we're sort of used to seeing, especially in UFC. I think it's kind of common to see somebody as wealthy as him in boxing because, you know, you can make money in that um, in that sport. But with the UFC, with Dana White, how he has a stranglehold on people's earning capabilities. There's a story recently of the UFC signing that deal with the website Crypto over $150 million and not a penny went to the fighters. And then when Dana White was pressed on it, he said, first of all, that each fighter will get the opportunity to discuss their their own terms personally and kind of bring their value to the table and then see how that works which again means no one's going to get any money and then when pressing it further he basically told everyone to go fuck themselves and if you want to change stuff go set up your own organization right so he continues to be an absolute asshole to the to the fighters they don't they don't seem to have any real yearning to fix the situation by unionizing and all the people outside can complain but in general for connor he's unique he's wealthy beyond any kind of measure he doesn't need to fight again ever again he's got businesses and ventures outside of fighting that make him tons and tons of cash so i think with how unique mma is with it being a fight in the cage essentially you're able to do whatever you want and use all your all your limbs all your extremities to kind of ensure that you kill the guy that's across the cage from your woman it just requires you to I think you require a little bit of um, hunger, like actual hunger. You require the understanding or the possibility that if you don't win this fight, that your daughter can't go to the private school that she loves anymore, that your wife can't go horse riding, that she suddenly loves again, and which has made her inadvertently love you again, that you can't, um, uh, you know, you can't put your parents in or your grandma, or whatever it may be, in that really great care home that you wanted, that you can't go on this holiday. Like you need to have that little bit of hunger and drive to decide to get into a case because everything. I've heard so far from retired MMA guys and UFC guys is that you know they all get scared before they go and fight they all get worried and they all get nervous and butterflies and some of them throw up um, in the change room before they go out into octagon so it's nothing that really comes I wouldn't say natural to somebody right so there needs to be some sort of external Ray reason and pressure that's driving you to go into that ring and do that or the octagon and do that and now that Connor doesn't have that and he has more money than God and he can do what the hell he wants and take his foot off the gas and he'd be okay it's difficult to muster up the motivation the desire the dog the fight whatever it may be to go into the ring and train or go into the ring and fight to death or to even train to death whatever it may be it's just not the same and he doesn't realize it now it feels like maybe he can turn it around but so far we haven't seen it we haven't seen him operate on the same level that uh, Floyd Mayweather does right even though he's extremely wealthy he still somehow manages to still have that same desire and drive to perform and to entertain in the octagon in the ring specifically when he's fighting anyway Khabib had some very choice words to say about Conor McGregor which I definitely agree with and Echo even as being a big Conor fan um, and definitely I think he, he has a point but in general it's really funny to see him have this real kind of idealistic sort of somewhat sensible view on things when in general the UFC is a mess Dana White is going to keep giving Conor fights as long as he can keep making him money you know for instance Nate Diaz is still getting fights in UFC even though he clearly is suffering from some forms of CTE right he still gets keep getting fights and even though he kind of you know is essentially a shadow of his former self so I'm sure if Conor McGregor still wants to fight he still wants to give me or no, no give me he still wants to put himself on the line um Dana will still do it because he is the only person that's able to command the attention that he did the other day. Even somebody as freakishly impressive to watch as a Francis Ngannou can't command the amount of eyes and attention that Connor does when he steps into the octagon. He's just another, he's just a whole different breed in that respect. So I, I think Khabib is kind of, you know, mistake, kind of forgets that part of the industry, the kind of entertainment Hollywood, um, get bums in seats side of things. That's basically allowing Connor to still have a career now, even though he's clearly not going to ever be champion. He's probably not going to be as active as he needs to be to be a contender to for the belt. So what's the point? But we continue. Retired, um, it says your headline retired, um, Khabib Nurmagomedov, fed up with the finish. Connor McGregor believes MMA should no longer support 
after loss. So the following um, retired UFC champion Khabib Nurmagomedov does not believe Conor McGregor will ever return to the top of mixed martial arts and believes that the sport should stop supporting this former rival after Saturday's loss to Dustin Poirier. Um, Nurmagomedov, who retired from MMA in 2020, defe defeated McGregor in a title fight on October 28. The build up and the fallout of that matchup were memorably ugly. McGregor, who threw a dolly at bus and Magomedov was on, insulted Magomedov's religion, wife, and father. After beating McGregor, and Magomedov famously leapt out of the octagon to confront his entire team yeah legendary occasion right i remember watching that live like screaming you know at flipping 5 a.m in the morning um after losing to dustin poirier via tko ufc 264 on saturday during which he broke his lower left leg mcgregor insulted poirier and made threats according to magomedov the sport will pay a price if it continues to build up mcgregor who doesn't who he doesn't think will ever be successful moving forward he said money and fame show who you are magomedov told the spm all the time we hear that money and fame change people no when money and fame come these two things show who you actually are and what was and what has mcgregor done he punched an old guy in a bar true in 2019 you guys can watch everything that he did and understand it's just like dustin said this guy is a bag of shit which is definitely true i definitely think there is that part of him in there but i somehow maybe i'm of the maybe because i'm a fan i'm kind of trying to look at it from the bright side of things i kind of feel like some of those things were him acting out because he was bored i generally do think that he didn't necessarily want to be this big mogul kind of kind of you know um don Corleone figure uh, when it comes to his brands and what he does i think in at his heart connor is still a mixed martial artist he's still a fighter that's which is probably why he ended up going into boxing he that's what he loves to do um i think anybody else that had the kind of you know aspirations to be more of a businessman and an all-round kind of you know uh, branding entertainment media figure i think they would have taken it for off the gas and pursued those other endeavors full time the fact that he's training and even trying to put himself in the octagon definitely goes to show that at the heart of it he still is mma fire which is definitely explained explains why when he has a lot of free time on his hands there's nothing to do because you know i'm assuming the day-to-day -day running of his brands and his businesses is done by other people and he might oversee stuff but there's a lot of time he probably just spends at home not doing much and when you got a lot of money and you're young and you're not you know they got no nothing to do in your calendar you sometimes get up to a madness which is like you know popping into a bar pub that you want to buy and punching one of the patrons because i don't know you just feel like it i think that's essentially what happened i don't think it's a reflection of what he's actually like i just think it's more so um a consequence of again of having too much money and, and loads of time on your hands it continues it says i saw a lot of tweets i tried to support him how are you going to support this guy when kids young generation watch him watch this sport if you want to promote your fight promote if the mma community is going to support this bad people this sport is going in one bad way and that's something that i've seen that i've kind of really been it's kind of been good to see in some respect because i think there was a period in time where a lot of people were trying to do the connor thing right when it comes to hyping fights and insulting people and being a bit of a brat but then it felt like obviously that was going a bit too far but now if and then then there's a time where people were kind of saying oh they're kind of all this um uh trolling and whatnot and arguing back and forth for things and pushing people like the weigh-ins is bad for the sport but then it feels like i think a lot of people have understood there is an entertainment quasi wwe point of mma which people have kind of slowly but surely reluctantly accepted but it still feels like people are like no there has to be a line there has to be a line drawn you can promote a fight you can push people's buttons if need be but you know no families no daughters no wives nothing too below the belt but people are more open it feels like or happy to have people kind of um play the game a little bit and then when they see connor obviously going over the line they feel like he's taking a piss and they're able to call it out a little bit more objectively it feels like going for i don't know maybe it's just me in terms of america's fighting career no matter said he does not expect his old rival to compete at high level due to an overall lack of hunger and leg injury he says without broken legs yes he could be the same the Michael Meadows said but with broken legs he's never going to kick the same with him no you don't I don't believe it he'll return to the top Connor have good age 32 but what happened with his mind legs this guy is finished but he's good for promotion so there's an understanding in that regard that he knows that he's good for the business but that's an interesting point that he made about the leg because I think Chris Weidman right he's a recent one to break his leg and he's trying to make a comeback to fight again of course he's had a very unlucky run prior to that with injuries with getting knocked out in fights that he probably shouldn't be losing and now he's in a position where people think that he should be hanging up his gloves and pursuing other things but he's clearly trying to prove a point maybe to himself and to other people that he can come back and again who is 
is it our place to tell an athlete when they should retire? Shouldn't they have the, I always think athletes should have the, um, should have the choice to decide when they want to go. Obviously the sport kind of in, inadvertently decides for you, but there's always, especially now with the abundance of streaming platforms and people trying to make money, there's always a league and a place that you can go to to fight, even if you're washed up. Um, but for the most part, the sport does tell you when it's time to kind of hang it up. So you're hoping that can happen. You're hoping it doesn't happen because when it does happen, it feels like it's a bit too late. You you can want, you kind of want to go out, um, you know, with your head held up high and you kind of voluntarily put in your gloves in the middle of the octagon as opposed to somebody telling you and tapping on the shoulder and saying hey you need to call it a day but the thing about kicks is interesting because you know connor is a you know it, it, when you think of him you think of that piston of a left hand and he's spinning attacks so once you get that sort of injury similar to somebody that you know for instance for myself a little slight example i pulled my back once bending over i think or sneezing or something stupid and ever since then it's been a thing that i have in the back of my head every time i'm lifting heavy right it doesn't it's not really going to affect me too deep because i mean i'm not trying to be a professional athlete or anything but it's a small thing that kind of is always in the back of my mind whenever i'm lifting bending or doing something that i kind of pulled my back really badly and i injured it so imagine what it must feel like if somebody broke your leg especially in the way that he did um trying to you know um um, win back an L that he thought he had and beat somebody that he obviously hates it must play a l real big games in your overall brain going forward so it definitely says a lot that a fellow fighter would say he's not going to be the same guy now that he's broken his leg you just don't come back and start kicking the same which is wild to think um, the continuous thing my, my brother went to say uh, he believes the UFC will pair McGregor against Poirier or Nate Diaz when he does return. But Mad McGregor expects McGregor to lose either of those matchups. Really? He expects him to lose against Diaz? Diaz looks pretty crap, for instance. No, no offense to him, but he looks terrible now. If McGregor can't be a Diaz, then he for sure is on the Donald Cerrone kind of um, tip in it. And Donald Cerrone hasn't had as many serious injuries. He hasn't had his... Hmm probably Donald Cerrone probably had more devastating kind of losses in terms of getting knocked out and stuff and getting sparked but phew, sad to see how things are rolling out for him the UFC tried to persuade the Magomedov 32 to not retire this month followed this announcement but the president Dana White ultimately accepted it in March and moved on with the 155 division Poirier is expected to face Charles Oliveira for the UFC lightweight championship later this year early 2022 so yeah man a lot of people are kind of damn bad on McGregor he's not in a good spot right now we all like a redemption story. We like people to come back and sort of recover themselves and get back on the level that they were prior. But it doesn't seem like this is the case. He seems like he's on a downward spiral somewhat, um, freaking out, you know, acting out, being a bit of a fool. It's sad to see. But, you know, unfortunately, some of these, the majority of these MMA greats or these mixed martial arts greats in general, the story definitely doesn't always end well, in it? They don't usually end um with a nice cute disney ending they kind of do end in this sort of weird car crashy way or sometimes in a really depressing way right and you find that this person's lost their home but we lost their family is desolate doesn't have any friends gets getting in street fights all the time like it doesn't end well so maybe we're just seeing the other end of it when somebody's got money and it's still not ending well um in that respect but hopefully he recovers hopefully he's able to kind of bounce back because again connor is definitely one of my faves definitely somebody that definitely got me interested to watch sport in the first place but i can recognize myself even being a bit of a fan that he's definitely acting a fool and definitely doing things that we just don't expect from him and stuff and to be honest as well like i said i just don't believe this hill i don't believe this persona he's putting on deep down he's not a bad dude um he's trying to become one to kind of give himself a reason as to why he's where he's at at the moment of his career but he's definitely not him so hopefully he recovers gets back well and somehow he's able to kind of rehabilitate his image because at the end of the day we all fell in love with the happy chappy kind of determined Irish dude who was just fighting and beating up everybody right we didn't fall in love with this kind of I'm not the braggadocious thing I don't mind but this kind of this sort of like um ego obsessed um you know delusional narcissistic dude this is not the guy that we fell in love with so hopefully he can recover that old personality he had prior and just kind of adopt it now that he's rich because i don't believe he's changed with money i just feel like he's just got too much time and too much money and that's why he's acting out but again maybe i'm wrong maybe i'm wrong 
Here we got good news courtesy of Billboard. Title of the Creators, Call Me If You Get Lost. Debuts at number one Billboard um, album charts. Definitely a big win in his respect, of course, as an artist. But just in terms of artistry, it's good to see actual good music that I legitimately enjoy. Because sometimes you see albums be number one and you just don't understand why. Um, you know, it just doesn't make any sense. You try and listen to it again because I'm, I'm a big stickler for listening to things that I don't necessarily would, that I wouldn't necessarily be interested in just so i can have my own kind of perspective and opinion on if it sounds good or not and i'm also a big believer in you know there's always a track a single a bridge a chorus a drop or something in someone's album that i'm going to like it's very rare that i don't like something from front to back how legitimately insane it's kind of somewhat impossible so i tried to listen to some of it but sometimes you listen to an album you're like i just don't get it i don't get why this is so high up in the charts so it's great to see someone like a title creator with such short notice too because it felt like he started promoting this album again aggressively or like properly album rollout wise maybe two to four weeks before the album actually dropped which is no time at all in terms of the um, album rollers we have nowadays um, you know he can he obviously in terms of the marketing material and the videos and stuff he went ham he did that the right way told a really good compelling story but the music from front to back on call me if you get losses probably the greatest example of his range in terms of being a producer right in terms of loads of really cool um 80s inspired r&b sort of tracks some really good rapidy rap sort of stuff the stuff of course with dj drama in terms of it being a gangster girls mixtape um with him kind of um speaking over some of the tracks was done tastefully good skits um good transitions nice bridges choruses melodies like just perfect from the front to the back so there's courtesy of billboard it says tyler creators um scores his second number one album on billboard top chart one 200 as his latest studio effort call me if you get lost debuts um atop the tally the set was announced on june 17th released on june 27th on 25th sorry via columbia records and earned 169,000 records um in this first week crazy in it 170 for call me i think he's had an incremental increase every time he's dropped it in total call me if you get lost is the artist um six top 10 and Tyler's previously hit number one with his last project, 2019 Eagle. So it looks like it takes two years in between each album, which is probably um, great in terms of artistry, in terms of quality of music for the fans. He gets times to kind of dig, dig deep, have some actual life experiences to be able to relay that. I'm still playing Wiltshire to till now, back and front. There's so many parts in it that I relate to, so many parts that touch me. I think I remember when I first heard Wiltshire the first way through, I kind of screamed at a certain part towards the end. I was like, God almighty, man, he's talking to me. He's talking to me so they build with chart 200 chart ranks amongst the most popular albums of the week in the u.s based on the multi-metric consumption as measured in the equivalent album units units comprised of album sales traffic equivalent albums um and the streaming equivalent albums um each unit equals one album sale or 10 individual tracks sold for an album 300 3750 ad supported or 120 250 paid subscription on demand official audio video streams generated by the song the new due 20 light chart call me if you get the debut on now will be positioned in four on Bibble's website on Wednesday the 7th of Call Me If You Get Lost 169 equivalent album units tracking the, the, the oh, it doesn't matter it's many many deals but yeah congratulations to, congratulations to Tyler number one album on the Billboard top 200 much much deserved um, then on the other side of things we have this article courtesy of Billboard, which is interesting. It says Billboard 200 has back of my mind opens to singers best first week sales yet. And this is a good argument or good debate or good place to start with the whole like industry plant thing. Um, I never really kind of thought of her too much as an industry plant just because I was too busy enjoying the music and the quality of the mix that she was putting out. But when I saw the numbers for this supposed debut album, which is, you know, far from a debut because she's got many other projects that came out prior to it. She's been in the industry, it feels like, for the best part of 10 years. And now she's doing a debut album, you know, the industry kind of food, the industry semantics and games they play is always a bit funny but seeing that she only sold what does it say here 30,000 I think units is it of the actual album itself that's pretty bad considering um yeah 36,000 and again the album's pretty decent it's not the best I still prefer her mixtapes but to sell 36,000 units first week considering the amount of Grammy wins that she has the amount of industry looks that she gets and the general 
you know well regard that she's kind of held in the industry does go to show that being an industry plant does pay off but then it doesn't have a good payoff when it comes to fan bases because i would argue she probably even though she has all these big grammys it's very unlikely that she could sell out an arena tour um it's very unlikely she could sell out many venues depending on the size especially if they're over 2500 for instance i'm sure it'd be difficult for her to sell out those venues in multiple states around the country despite having grammys and you would imagine having a grammy or having an oscar as much as they're a representation of your uh, of your kind of skill in the you know field that you're doing or whatnot it's more so a reflection of your kind of profile because you don't really it's very rare someone wins a grammy or in kind of an oscar based on like an independent movie that no one really watched apart from a small subject of people it's usually most so a popularity content whether it's kind of with the public or with people in the industry so with that being said you need to be put in those rooms you need to be talked about around certain people in order for you to even get those looks so if you're not her you're not getting those looks in the first place but then also you get the looks you get the grammys on your mantle place but then you don't have the fans right you don't have the streets quote to quote you don't have vintage anything and you're again thinking about it going forward the only people that have actually heard mention her in like a musical sense has been the joe budden podcast right they've been sort of her biggest fans in terms of championing the music she makes because for instance when rory and mal or rory and joe budden were still on, or when rory and was still on there him and joe are really big r&b heads so they would always talk really well about her but i've never really heard anybody else speak about her you don't really you know there's not really a her hive that exists it feels like it just feels a little bit you know she's an artist in that respect in that pure sense of the word she's not really jumping on instagram live every other day but there's not a there's not the attention that she is the, the attention around her music doesn't exist as people think it's the same with lizzo you think in it for you usually hear about lizzo on social media everything apart from the music gets spoken about with her and with her it feels like everything apart from the fans get spoken about her, which might be a good place to start who knows because on one side of things i believe you can be an industry plant and be insanely good at what you do so Liz, uh, lizzo and uh, her is a good example right you can actually be very you can actually be placed in a position or put in a position for you to win but you could also be incredibly talented i think that moray kid is a good example too you know it felt like everybody and their mum kind of saw that video that he popped out with at the same time which is obviously not a coincidence it's definitely a coordinated sort of approach to do that behind the scenes um but again industry plant but then incredibly talented too but there's also the other end of the thing where you can be an industry plant where they get you because you just got an interesting look about you you got green hair and weird piercings but then your music is terrible so it's twofold in that respect but it is quite shocking to see her only sell 36,000 units considering the amount of looks that she gets and it makes me think back to how Tyler was a bit aggrieved when him and DJ Khaled were going back and forth no DJ Khaled it was actually Big Sean I think that's the reason why they kind of still have if I'm not mistaken a bit of static because I remember Tyler and making a big point to say i think that might have been it might have been um cherry bomb or something one of those albums that came out when big sean's album came out and he was like i don't have any cosigns i don't have any big industry collabs on my album all done by myself self produce all this sort of stuff and i'm still out selling these guys who have all the help in the world um and all the press behind them and um it is good sometimes to see artistry win and the machine not win when they press a button but sometimes people game it and kind of you know let it equate that way but yeah congrats to her regardless because you know putting out your artwork in general is difficult anyway it doesn't really matter in what level that you do it it really doesn't matter on what level next on list here we have news courtesy of the new york times phoebe philo former designer at celine and chloe is back uh big news across obviously the majority of the interwebs or the interwebs that i'm part of and people that i kind of follow um and um maybe nervous um energy being this uh, nervous energy being distributed i don't know whatever this new sense shockwaves around the scene um so much so that i saw some instagram stories courtesy of brian boy or flipping jonathan anderson being a little bit touchy on his instagram stories calling out certain journalists who were basically saying in an article praising phoebe philo that jonathan anderson isn't selling as well as he 
as well as he hoped he has, whether it's with Luebe of his own namesake brand. But regardless, her coming back, Phoebe Fowler is definitely going to send shockwaves to the industry and definitely put a pe- couple of people on notice. Um, more so brands like, you know, Perenza Schurler, per- 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 The Row, um, obviously maybe Bottega Veneta, per- brands that I felt like kind of capitalize on her hiatus, which is only, again, reading the article, it's only been three and a half years, you know. It feels like much longer that she's kind of been out of fashion and decided to kind of pursue other things you know be a stay-at-home mom and just kind of tapped out of the you know crazy fashion calendar cycle whatever it may be but it's only three and a half years and i've said the other day on twitter i think some would argue which i would argue for sure that there's some kind of correlation between zara going downhill nowadays right no one really talks about zara there's a, there a point where zara was like in everyone's conversation because of how quickly and kind of expertly they were able to copy um loads of key runway pieces and kind of disseminate them around all their stores for a fraction of the cost with you know far less um expensive materials and whatnot and of course they're definitely going to end up in some random landfill somewhere and cover the nose of some turtle somewhere but no one cares because they want to get their fits off but in general, it seems to be that some sort of correlation between Phoebe Fowler stepping away from fashion three and a half years ago and Zara slowly but surely dying a slow death. Now, some of it might be in part with all these Instagram brands pumping up and, you know, these little startups and one 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 woman brand things that are happening that are kind of filling that void. But in terms of filling that kind of yummy, mummy, professional kind of um, woman market that, you know, I wouldn't say girl mom or girl boss, whatever it is, um, clientele that Phoebe Fowler located to, it feels like they've somehow been um, split across different brands or moved to different things. Maybe they're tapping into Victoria Becker. Maybe again, perhaps a Schurler thing. Maybe it's a Hermes thing. Maybe it's a whatever it may be, but they've gone certain places. Now, the wonder is, will they come back again? That's the thinking. Will they come back? Um, do they care? Had they moved on? I'm not too sure, but I definitely think... Um, Phoebe Fowler has that kind of uh, loyalty amongst her customers that some designers just don't have in the same way that maybe Mark Jacobs has where he comes back and everyone's sort of like, you know, uh, fanning themselves off at the amount of heat is about to drop. And I think Phoebe Fowler has the same sort of power, especially with this sort of mystique around her, how she's press shy, um, you know, has very um, differenting views when it comes to how the fashion calendar and the demands put on designers. Like she's kind of cultivated this air of mystique and kind of uh, principles behind the things that she does so people kind of want to rally behind her so i'm sure people are going to be eager to drop some of their hard-earned cash on some of her designs if she eventually does make a comeback so it's a courtesy of new york times it says listen do you hear that um courtesy of vanessa freeman it says listen do you hear that it's the intake of breath afterwards so after thousands of women uh, fashion prayers have finally been answered phoebe filo the patron say of dressing for the female gaze a designer whose work convinced joan didion to pose for an ad and turned her customers into groupies is returning to business on her own terms three and a half years after leaving her most um her last post as artistic director of celine miss filo 48 is finally putting her name where her artistic her aesthetic is and introducing yes phoebe filo an independent clothing and accessories line though it will be partly backed by LVMH why would they say it's independent if it's backed by LVMH is that just a semantics that doesn't make any sense to me you can't be independent and be backed by LVMH this is the same argument people were having with like Chance the Rapper right when he's like no I'm independent no you can't be independent if you've got an Apple deal it doesn't make any sense right like that's the complete opposite of what independent is but anyway it continues Miss Fowler's former employer the luxury behemoth will have only a minority stake allowing Miss Philo to retain control and to govern the experiment as she sees fit according to a news release. For, of course, she's it seems like she's quite demanding and has she's very um finicky and picky with the things that she does and doesn't do. And if they're able to kind of lure her out of her, you know, kind of somewhat um self imposed sabbatical, then for sure they're going to bend over backwards to make sure that she's happy. They're gonna whatever they can put into place, whether it's having a studio in London or whatever it may be, or giving her days off looking for her after her kids, anything that she wants, they'll definitely make sure they cater to it. So if that means even taking a minority stake just to make sure that she puts out clothes because you'd much rather have one percent, five percent under fifty percent of whatever Phoebe Fowler makes for ever many for many years because you know it's going to be a success as opposed to not having that possibility, right? As opposed to putting in money in other people who don't sell because that's a weird thing about Phoebe Fowler, um, and the designs that she's done, especially with Celine and more so even with Chloe. 
she sells in it like it's one of those weird designers that somehow has because there's not a lot of them that exist especially when you watch stuff like show studio right a lot of those people have a you know the, the, the designers they all seem to love on there the editors are the ones that don't sell right are the ones that normal everyday people on the street don't give a shit about um but then sometimes you have those weird people that exist like you know like a phoebe Fowler, like a raf like a demna who seem to have the ear and the attention of the fashion is my passion crew and also the general punters who just want to look amazing at work want to look amazing every day in their everyday life and whatnot right um and for sure lvmh have seen that and they said look we're going to make every kind of concession necessary to make you comfortable and make sure that you're happy in your position and then we're just going to let you run free and do your thing because you know again She's a professional to work in the industry, you know, for you know, more than two decades. She's got, she knows what to do. And if anything, the game, the scene, the industry needs her. Right? They, her voice is needed now more than ever, it feels like. So for sure, this is a kind of perfect marriage in that respect. It continues. Being in my studio making once again has been both exciting and incredibly fulfilling, says Miss Philo in an announcement. I'm very much looking forward to being back in touch with my audience and people everywhere. Oof, I love that statement. I'm very much looking forward to being back together with my audience and people everywhere so all those people that run up to the row and all that and they're getting excited that their sales are going up because people were because phoebe fellow wasn't around anymore she's basically saying I, ho I hope you enjoyed your little time in the sun now the big lady's back the big big boss bitch the bbb is back she's going to call the shots and you know suddenly all your sales will dry up it says here the reticence is not surprising from the designer who often appeared at the end of her run with her head half hidden in a polo neck she rarely gave interviews and since her departure has turned to somewhat of a greater garb of the industry as she in media social media and paparazzi are tracking photo ops it's true there's meant to be a really big fashion forces panel thing that she was meant to do I, th I think it might have been before lockdown and maybe before that even i don't know if that even happened i remember seeing that being advertised and suddenly they stopped advertising it so maybe they pulled a rug um on that one or pulled the plug on that i don't really know but it'll be interesting to see what she does going forward because again the landscape of fashion has changed too right people at the time wanted phoebe fire to talk and wanted more you know information and touch and insight from her and what she does and she was quite press shy at that time but nowadays it feels like everybody and their mum wants to get in front of a camera on the ig live stream and tell people about the inspiration of their design people want they want to feel connected somewhat to the stuff that they're buying. Their demands on people and designers are a lot more strenuous than they were prior than she left, than before she left, even though it was crazy then. It was, you know, fashion has gone, moved on so much since, uh, well, the industry has kind of got more crazy since she's kind of left. So I, I'm interested to see how she approaches the media going forward. I continue to send more information about what exactly Phoebe Philo, the brand, will be promised in January. Will it be only women's wear, women's wear, men's, unisex? In the meantime, however, a few clues are buried out. Hopefully, it's men's as well. Hopefully, oh, definitely, hopefully. It doesn't really matter if it's not men's because there's going to be dudes that are going to buy it anyway because usually the fits and the shapes of Phoebe Philo's work are quite forgiving to guys, especially if you're on the slimmer side. You can get away with wearing a shirt, a blouse, a pair of trousers, a coat and stuff very, very well. But it would be nice if she just decided you know what i'm gonna bless you guys and just give you something that you want to wear too but again i think the singularity of her vision only given to the kind of women side of things is probably where her special power or superpower is so it might be beneficial just to kind of double down on what you do best instead of kind of trying to spread yourself thin it says for example the line will be exceptional quality which is generally fashion speak for the high luxury end of pricing and material spectrum it will likely be based in london miss Fyler's home and where her celine studio was okay despite the brand's headquarters being in paris oh so i'm interested to see who the team is going to be as well is she going to jack people from other brands is it going to be people that she worked with prior who have been out of the business i wonder it's not a big leap to guess that it may it may have created on the design sorry it's not a big leap to guess that it may be created on the designer's own schedule given the emphasis on self-determination and given father's history of shafting um against the demands of the fashion system during her 10 years at celine and her five year stint at chloe where she became the first designer at the major brand to take in maternity leave which is insane to think in it really and then on the other side of things you got her being very picky and selective with how she works and on the other side of things you got you know Carl Lagerfeld before he passed so, you know R.I.P. to the great one he didn't turn down the opportunity to do more work right look at people like a Virgil Abloh who's basically taking that mantle like it is not a collaboration that he doesn't want to do um so it's interesting to see if that will have because again people are in fashion are proper copycats and love to just do whatever someone else is doing so it'd be interesting to see if other designers 
when she gives her first major interview talking about the pressures of the industry and how it led her to be stressed and all this sort of stuff it'd be interesting to see if other designers also piggyback off the back of it and try to get some sort of arrangement made where they can take maternity leave or take breaks or you know have time to recharge because now with two collections a year plus resort and you know all the other activations that need to be done and appearances and whatnot it's just it just seems exhausting to keep up with especially with the demands of the consumer the never-ending change in trends and whatnot it just feels maddening and the unforgiving relenting pressure that the press give you right one minute you're the angel and you're the one and next minute you're a joke you don't know what you're doing so it's crazy it continues perhaps she will bypass a seasonal show will entirety i'm sorry the entire Perhaps she will bypass the seasonal show wheel entirely for a new version of slow fashion, one that is altogether more sustainable. Perhaps she will be the designer who is really, who is really able to take a stand against the dominant culture of disposability and the ravenous more of the content monster created by TikTok and Instagram. An announcement. Oh yeah, interested in it. Do you think Phoebe Fowler is going to be on TikTok? Hopefully she's not. Please, for the love of God, leave that alone. In the answer to Bernard Arnault, the chairman of LVMH, called the new line an entrepreneurial adventure what does that even mean this i love the ceo speak in it entrepreneurial venture what independent but owned by ovmh how does that make sense like anyway we continue despite the fact that phoebe fowler's brand is not officially part of the luxury group that lvmh is once again linked with phoebe fowler given her most wanted status as a coupe for the conglomerate certainly it will make it will be a mistake to assume that Fifth Fowler's return to fashion will look anything like her past after all Chloe, which is synonymous with a certain cool girl attitude, sending a generation of young women into the baby doll dresses and Claude Hopper wooden wedges. Look nothing like her Celine, which was imbued with a kind of radical maturity, elevating the maid leotard and the oversized navy cashmere sweater to desirability and kicking start or well, kickstarting the trend of luxury Birkenstocks besides Daniel Lee who worked closely with Miss Philo at Ready to Wear director and Celine is currently doing a similar but different version of the brand of his role at a creative director Bottega Vanessa yeah very true and he's decided to take this interesting approach with Bottega Vanessa since isn't it it feels like you know there's been what did brand boys say like he's pandering to black people it feels like right there's a show that's meant to be happening in detroit which doesn't really make much sense it's cool for detroit it's a cool look i'm sure he's going to be utilizing loads of local creatives and whatnot and spearheading loads of interesting initiatives that's definitely going to help people on the ground so as cynical and as opportunistic as it may be it's definitely going to help people so i'm happy with that kind of exchange but that's a really weird one will phoebe father come back and try and you know be the answer to all women all over the world or try to talk to a specific person or just reflect or to, how would the coaches reflect her journey like you think of chloe that was when she was a bit younger and maybe kind of di directly kind of, or maybe a bit younger or longing for the years when she was younger and be able to kind of imbue some of her desires and wants into those clothes when it moved into celine it was her kind of becoming a mother and kind of again trying to design clothes that would fit a professional woman's lifestyle without looking too frumpy and without looking too dull and you know unappealing whatever it may be in whatever way whether it's a male or female gaze and then you'd imagine now being you know uh, a legit mom maybe she's not trying to have more kids i don't think who knows maybe the attitude and the ideas going into the clothes now with this new brand is completely different maybe it is something more for you know middle-aged women who want to look a bit cute on a weekend who want to have you know clothing that's functional things that you can go hiking with and you could go out with afterwards thing that you know um doesn't necessarily react too badly to mistakes and mishaps when you're out gardening i don't know whatever i'm sure it will be self uh, i'm sure it'll be self-referential in that way it'll reflect definitely where she's at as a person as opposed to kind of being a trend thing because it feels like some of the other people that have come forth so far have been trying to fill a void right they've been trying to maybe capture that market that audience whereas i feel like with phoebe Fowler, she's just tried to make her own that's probably why someone like a highly semenoid wins because it feels like he's just designing his own wardrobe right he's kind of um insular in that way same with the rick owens right he's sort of trying to basically design stuff that fits within his own universe and if you if you want to be a part of it you want to be a part of it. if you don't you don't but it doesn't necessarily change with the whims of this industry and the trends too tough it's just kind of them moving to the beauty on drums so i think my assumption is that it's going to be more self-reflective in that way it'll just be 
essentially you know clothes that are inspired or clothes that are, clothes that would reflect well on somebody that is maybe a bit more accomplished maybe a bit more steady a bit more comfortable in who they are and got a family all that sort of stuff it will kind of fit in well in that respect going forward or maybe just be carefree i don't know who knows if miss fellow is back it's presumably because she is something entirely new to say for the new world which means that not only the thing which means that the only thing for certain is that the rumor mill, which has put the name of Phoebe Fire on the running for pretty much every creative director job since um, the start of 2018, including Burberry, Chanel, Ferragamo, Laura Piana, will finally be silenced. And that not just the fashion world, but those yearning for an image of themselves they can't quite yet define will be watching. Yeah, there were a lot of rumors about her going to different houses. There was a rumor, I think, the Givenchy one before Matthew Williams was confirmed there. I don't necessarily think they're not true. I definitely think conversations were had behind the scenes and maybe she just decided to do something else and and if I, I would imagine if it was me if i went to come back after such a kind of quote it's not long but in fashion years it probably is long three and a half year hiatus i'd want to try to just do something under my own name especially given the you know amount of esteem that she's kind of acquired over this time and if it fails fair enough i failed on my own dime as opposed to coming back trying to fail reinventing a house or you know adding a new kind of perspective on a particular brand it always feels like that defeat is a lot more harder to take than failing on your own namesake because there's you know things that go around it in terms of the industry and business wise that can affect it look at someone like Heide Aikerman for instance when you fail with your own namesake there is a possibility to kind of bounce back from that a lot better and maybe it doesn't has such a psychological blow as it does going into a house with heritage and customers already disappointing them disappointing the shareholders it feels like it takes a lot to kind of recover from that kind of debilitating defeat so for sure this is the best option available for her to succeed and to do something great so i'm definitely looking forward to that when that ends up happening moving on what else do we have here berets we have beats we have this oh yeah this is interesting and this is courtesy of people this is definitely another case of you know hmm if, it, if you're white it's all right or definitely more so a case of you know wealth in america definitely goes a long way in terms of determining your overall prison sentence right it definitely does especially when it comes to somebody who has a lot of brand deals and money on the line attached to their name and shit in it so this is courtesy of people it says here drake bell sentenced to two years probation and child endangerment cases victims speak out right for some reason in the u.s i think in the uk for the most part if you have anything concerning kids that you're kind of alleged to do it seems like either it gets swept underneath the rug and people just try and silence the story but very rarely if it goes to the course you get away with it right for some for sure if you're doing your heinous crimes i think industries and sectors and people that we position can maybe protect you to to a certain extent but once the news hits the broadsheets hits the press hits the media hits the public consciousness it's very difficult for you to come out of it unscathed very, very difficult but in america for some reason whether it's you know bill cosby slipping out of the prison after slipping girls and mickey or district bell guy getting a two years probation sentence after messing around with an underage kid it just seems like if you've got money and access and a good attorneys you can generally get off things that you shouldn't be getting off of like at all right it should be one of those things where suddenly if you get accused of something to do with children it's just it's a lock off for you but again this guy was able to kind of squirm out of this. It says the following, Drake Bell has been sentenced to two years probation after pleading guilty to criminal charges involving a minor. The actor born Jared Bell pleaded guilty on June 23rd to uh, attempted endangerment children, a fourth degree felony and a misdemeanor charge of dis dis disseminating matter harmful to juveniles during a virtual appearance on cleveland court on monday the 35 year old doesn't look 35 and it's very well here doesn't look 35 um but then i guess it's, it's the tricks they do isn't it they make him shave his facial hair um they put on a lot of makeup so he looks a little bit more smooth skin but i'm sure if you met him in real life he probably does look his age but you know they've got these little tricks that they do in the industry if ever year old was sentenced to two years probation and 200 years of community 200 years 200 hours of community service he was also prohibited from contacting the victim during the hearing bell's victim now 19 spoke publicly for the first time to read a full statement in which she called drake and josh alum the epitome of evil she accused bell of grooming her from age 12 again this isn't one of those kind of controversial ones where you know she was 15 but she looked like she was 18 
12 years old is 12 years old i've yet to meet or i've yet to meet i definitely don't meet them don't bring anybody i've not met anybody but i've definitely yet to see a 12 year old that looks anywhere like an adult or anywhere close to being adult right 12 years look like 12 years especially well in the uk i don't know how it's in the us but for sure before you hit you don't really start looking older until you're over the age of 13 for the most part and you have a little growth spurt but usually under the age of 13 you definitely look your age so imagine somebody you know as old as drake bell was even at that time he was maybe what in his late 20s talking to a 12 year old like god damn he says here um our 12 allegedly sexually abusing her when she was 15 she is her statement i choose to write this statement because i want justice to be served more than anything um the only thing um the only time that the defendant has appeared in court in person on june the third for his arrangement which was before the media found out about the case um he has been appeared in court today over zoom instead of appearing in person this doesn't surprise me and shows the cow that he is but i'm not a coward wow well on her she detailed the pain Bell allegedly caused her. And I'm assuming his advisors probably didn't want him to go to court to avoid all those crazy press photos because they, because as weird as, as bad as the story is, because it's all been done under over Zoom and kind of been done, you know, in the confines of a judge's office or whatnot or whatever it may be and digitally or whatnot, it somehow kind of removed the sickness and the disgustingness and the horror of the situation, right? And because again, people are generally worried about their day-to-day -day future prospects and, you know, furloughs and stuff are running out across the world. There's a spike in the variant. People are generally worrying about other things as opposed to concentrating on what Joe Drake um, Bell is getting up to. So that decision not to have him appear in court physically might be a bit of a master stroke in terms of perception. Obviously he's guilty as fuck it sounds like. It sounds like he's a complete creep and a monster but they really played the game well here by preventing him to go into court. None of those crazy pictures of him covering his face, being harassed by the press out, outside, going to and from his car, it doesn't exist. So it's very cleverly done in that way. And as, as long as he's able to avoid getting in any kind of skirmish with, with those sort of um, um, kind of uh, one man band paparazzi places, like I don't know what they're called, they're on YouTube, right? Those kind of people that harass you with the camera and stuff. As long as he's able to kind of not bite on some of the things that they say and kind of keep his head down, he can somehow be able to somehow recover from this, which is mad to think. And you know? you'd think usually anything concerning kids, that's it, you're excommunicated, you're done. But somehow he's been able to make this work for himself. It's absolutely insane. So this doesn't surprise me at all. She continues, says she detailed the pain that Bell allegedly caused her, which she said resulted in panic attacks and nightmares she also said her parents have spent more than seven thousand dollars for her to get therapy she cashed the um what is it uh, the quote here he was calculating he preyed on me and sexually abused me she said alleging that this that he sent her photos of his genitalia he is a monster and a danger to children she concluded jared drake bell is a pedophile and this is his legacy Bama mia. Bell's attorney, Ian Friedman, said during the hearing that his client had accepted responsibility in this case. So he's accepted responsibility with via a plea. However, Ms. Friedman disputed the victim's claim that she and Bell had exchanged specific photos, claiming that there was no such evidence. So if there's no evidence, why are you accepting the plea? I guess because they put you in a corner and they basically tell you if you want to go to the courts and, you know, have this being judged in court properly with an actual, um, what you call it? with everybody else i don't know what that panel is called whatever you call it, right if you want to go to it that way then there's more of a possibility of you being found guilty and maybe getting a more severe sentence and obviously going running out in a press but if you're able to agree with this stuff behind the scenes the defendants with the defense lawyers and the prosecution you can come to an agreement and basically kind of get away with it Bill, um, Bell issued his own brief statement to a judge before receiving his official sentencing. He said, I accept this plea because my conduct was wrong. I'm sorry that the victim was harmed in any way, but that was obviously not my intention. Huh? You know, your intention is to talk to a 12 year old. I would like to know exactly what the case. I'm sure there's some details I'm missing out on this, but from what it looks like, from what I'm reading, it looks really bad. But I would like to understand why he would think it was a good idea or why how how he explains the way he's talking to a 12 year old but then again contact can mean anything right contact can mean if somebody left you a good message on your instagram and you replied to it that might constitute as having communication with somebody and then they took it to dm so you didn't know who they were, who they were. you just didn't get their profile you just kept talking and maybe that's the case but i just can't see a, a place a scenario where talking to a 12 year old in any kind of manner outside of just saying hi bye where's your parents makes any sense i don't see it but again what do i know 
He says, yeah, I, I'm sorry the victim was harmed anyway, but that wasn't my intention. I've taken this matter very, very seriously. And again, I just want to apologize to her and anyone else who may have been affected by my actions. The judge declared that Bell did take advantage of the victim as she didn't have the emotional or mental maturity to properly engage in any of the situation. Your position and celebrity status enabled you to nurture this relationship. You were able to gain access to this child. You were able to gain the trust of the child. So it's a two-edged sword, your position. <coughs> So I said, I'll continue. I hope you're truly remorseful. I don't know if you are. <coughs> so even the judge thinks he's a bit of a creep. The judge has got all the information. He's read everything about the case back and forward, uh, from the front to the back. And even he isn't sure this guy is legit in what he's saying. In a statement issued after the sentencing, Bell's attorney said, today's plea and sentence reflect conduct for which Mr. Bell did not accept res did respect responsibility. Sorry, The victim's allegations that went beyond that, which all parties agreed, not only lack supporting evidence, but are contradicted by the facts learned throughout the extensive investigation. As the court made clear, this plea was never about sexual misconduct or sexual relations with any person, let alone a mind. So what was it about then? What? Textual registration was not imposed as Mr. Bell did not plead guilty to any such offence. Drake and his family are relieved to have this matter behind them. He looks forward to once again performing for all of his supportive fans around the world. <coughs> now, that's the thing. I'm generally not a fan of cancellation. I generally think the idea that, you know, industries and labels and brands and uh, production companies and TV platforms can basically um, decide very selectively to d who gets a career and who doesn't get a career after a bit of a public scandal is of course um, out of order because the rules don't always apply the same to everybody else so I don't believe in cancellation that way I only believe in cancellation in the idea of your fans deciding <clears throat> that something that you did does not vie or does not match or vibe with their morals and ethics and principles and I think you're seeing that a bit in like music pertaining to Kanye West and that sort of stuff I think a lot of his fans by and large have kind of jumped ship based on his um, endorsement or love of Trump and some of the other things that he did <clears throat> during the period of when he was acting out and I think that's okay I think it's fine if the fans decided they don't want any parts of you anymore because of what has been alluded to in the press but there's also this thing that I'm also a fan of is like if the fans decided they want to support you then you should be allowed to have a career I don't think the venue should come in and say no you can't perform here blah 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 I think if fans want to pay tickets to go and see you which is definitely a hard thing to convince fans to do it definitely separates the kind of you know the wannabes from the actual legit stars people that can get people you know to uh, bums in seats um, to pay the entry free to go into a venue if you can make that happen for yourself despite having such a heinous and disgusting crime over your head and fans are also not aware of the crime and don't mind again giving you the hard-earned money and buying merch and listening to you perform on stage then so be it but unfortunately the world that we live in at the moment it feels as if like once you get exon not exonerated but once you get punished by the courts you don't exactly get the chance to sort of live your life it feels as if the media the press um parts of the industry decided to then um kind of pick up the mantle of being the judge and jury and deciding whether or not you can have a career again and that's where i think he gets a bit out of order because again he had a plea deal it's disgusting what happened but if his fans want to go see him you have to let it run you can't be as a venue then start preventing him from being able to put you know food on his table and support his family and all that sort of stuff it just i don't it just doesn't sit right with me but i do like the idea that fans decide hey we don't want you to have a career that I have no problem with actually going forward. Um, local NBC affiliate CAX previously reported that the incident occurred in December 2017, the same time Bell was scheduled to perform at a venue in Cleveland. The incident involved Bell engaging in an appropriate chat with a 15-year-old victim that was at the time sexual in nature. Though he initially pleaded guilty um, to the charge, not guilty to the charge, sorry, following his arrest, Bell later agreed to a plea deal and said he was guilty of both charges. His attorney told the people at the time, all questions about this case will be answered by our sentencing, including why Bell chose to enter these pleas. List Less than a week later, Bell and Joseph Lamar revealed on Twitter that he is married and has a child. So why did he reveal? That's a weird thing. Isn't it? As that Kevin Spacey, after he gets accused of sexual misconduct with that guy from Star Trek or whatever, he comes out and says, I'm gay. He's like, yeah, don't worry, dude, we knew. So this is what this is kind of his um, redemption arc, right? He's going to post pictures of him and his kid and his child. The wife is going to get absolutely pelters on flipping social media. Like sometimes, sometimes being horny, like it has the price that you pay for being horny not only your relationship it, you know it gets completely 
you know destroyed and whatever it may be but it's the other people that it affects right that's like sometimes you have to be as a guy like forget the underage stuff of it because that's the nasty side of it but just in general being a pop star and being overly horny the damage it can do to your loved ones is just I've, i think irreparable really in it really if you think about it because there's one thing your partner forgiving you for cheating you know everyone has their um their sort of um their criteria for things that will make them leave somebody i don't think it's fair to judge them in that way but it's just a necessary hassle and trouble that she's going to come in contact with, especially if he sees a well-known person i'm assuming drake you know this drake just guy definitely or drake bell goes definitely has fans or stands that know every intimate part of his um personal life so for sure they know who she is for sure they have some sort of engagement with her prior to these allegations so it's just a very unfortunate thing to be involved in especially for his family and friends that's not for him he's a piece of shit you know getting into contact with a 15 year old like i, I don't know i don't know again maybe because i'm older and i don't really understand it but i would never understand why somebody with the access to so many girls of age would purposely go for girls under age maybe again it's a kink thing maybe it's a um once you've completed all the levels of sexual pros promiscuity there's only kind of one other way you can go right um there's only one other thing that you can do and that's maybe to start trying to approach younger and younger girls because that makes you somehow get weirdly excited i don't really know but either way it's kind of gross kind of disgusting and like you know bury him under the jails i say bury him under the bloody jails um and i think that might be it you know maybe a bit of a macabre place to end but you know i try my best to keep this podcast as um, entertaining as macabre as possible but let's end it on here actually let's, let's make it more um uplifting in news that is not going to surprise anybody especially off the back of the september sorry the july the 19th announcement that clubs and bars can reopen fold have finally finally confirmed news that they're going to reopen with a full bevy of events the first event is going to be a friends and family one only affair on the 23rd i think it is on a friday which is absolutely fantastic i think it's an extended party and it's go here on the instagram account on their stories i think they uploaded it on their stories here let's see if it's still there yeah i gotta go back a bit it's ruined du, 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 du. i'll probably upload it before so you guys don't think i'm talking on my ass let's go come on okay there we go it's loading now bear with me a second <clears throat> loading 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 is it gonna load is it going to load is it going to load in time who knows who knows oh come on son it's not having it, it? it's not bloody having it come on son is it loading it no it's not having it, is it it's not it's not having it mate okay let's exit for a minute and then refresh this page maybe because i've got to refresh it so it could be a bit weird that way yep it's definitely just refreshed it Re refresh it again but yeah 19th it's going to be one of the most messiest days i think in um uk club culture for sure people are going to be going out of their minds um hopefully people keep themselves safe and stuff but there's definitely going to be a bunch of bodies on the floor in every major high street across the uk um, if you're out and about, keep yourself as safe as possible. Okay, let's see if this loads now. Is it going to load? Yeah, there you go. Cool. So they announced this earlier. Let's go back to the start. I saw this already. I'm really looking forward to it. So they said the following. Come on, come on. <clears throat> oh, what's happening now? It's not loading it's not loading it's not having it oh maybe they uploaded the post on their page as well itself so i'd have to go on here maybe we can just do that it's not loading it's not is it it's not happening is it maybe it's just on their page see if i can go on their page <laughs> it should be on their page yeah it is definitely there it is i think it's there it? right yeah cool so this is the post on the page itself is that gonna load now is that gonna take ages Oh my god. IG seems to not work when I'm on OBS recording and stuff. I don't know why that's the case. Maybe it's my settings, maybe it's the incapability of stretching this MacBook that I have at the moment. I don't know what's going on, but it definitely isn't loading the way it should do. Or the way it should be. Or the way it has to. 
It's just taking a sweet ass time. Come on. What's going on here? I have no idea. Okay, let's refresh. <laughs> Hopefully this works now. Ba 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 ba. Yes, there we go. Finally, it's back. So, yep. Yeah, um, this is courtesy of Fold. This is after 16 months of lockdown darkness. Yeah, let's just go again. So, they're going to reopen. So, Fold, one of the premier clubs here in London, one of my favorite places to go to, a place that was originally billed as the first 24 hour nightclub in London, which effectively didn't happen for a long period of time, basically because of some other, you know, madness that Fold ended up getting themselves into, which I think negatively affected their ability to get late licenses. But, you know, it still didn't matter because they were able to run until four and six for the most part. It's pretty near to where I live. So, it's definitely within walking distance that makes it easy to go out on a complete bender and not have to worry about having to spend 20 quid on an uber so it definitely still up there one of the best places and again in terms of programming has definitely some of the better djs that are playing in london overall and some of the kind of more forward-thinking club nights and um uh people that go there probably some of the best club kids that you've probably kind of encountered um as apart from going to other places in europe so definitely still one of the premier places to go to despite not having the a possibility of doing the 24-hour license thing that they were kind of uh, built to having but that aside they said after 16 long months of dark we were able to announce the first shows and we were immersed in the shadows so it's a new beginning with so much uncertainty surrounding the government's restrictions we were not able to press forward with our schedule and share with you our plans until now there's something that I definitely respected of them in that respect they definitely um, were very shy and very resistant to announcing any kind of um, sit down affairs with tables and stuff what I was happy about because the one thing you don't want to do in a place like Fold is to go there and see it at less at kind of it's kind of um, diminished power right Right? If you have a vision of fold in this dance floor, the last thing you want to do is go there, sit on a table, um, you know, surrounded by loads of flipping um, barriers and gates and security telling you not to stand up and stuff. It just takes away from everything, right? The whole pur purpose of going into that dark, dingy club is to kind of lose yourself in ecstasy and kind of go completely crazy. Not having that possibility of doing that is not really the great way to go about things over there, I would imagine. So say for our opening weekend, Fold presents a free days and nights of events celebrating the music and values that inspire us on Friday, July the 3rd, 23rd. We will throw open, we will, we will throw open our doors for an extended 18 hours reopening session. So they're going to go from Friday, Saturday and Sunday. Saturday night welcomes back close family, Rapture London across three rooms. Then after a short intermission, we move to the final stretch, our core unfold daytime event across 12 hours from 10 a.m. to 10 p.m. For the opening party, we have invited our friends and residents to launch um, the new chapter of our togetherness and um, we'll be having ZZ7 Live Anna Bellario Annabelle something here something anyway the name's all there Dax J1 Gareth Wilde, James Newmark, and a special guest who's yet to be announced. The lineup for Rapture London have, um, sorry, Rapture Rant London will be revealed early this week. Would like so, da, 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 you see the people on there. Limit numbers of 50 tickets will be available for advance at the Ford website for the reopening party. The remaining allocation will be available on the door. Tickets in the bio, links in the bio. So again, people are going crazy over that. So that's definitely great news in terms of reopening. I'm probably going to make my way over there for the opening party, of course, to kind of, you know, pop my face in there and show face and make sure I can catch a vibe going forward for sure and um this definitely marks the beginning of the reopening of things like i said before like fold were one of the only i think places that didn't try to do something with tables or whatnot they kept it you know kind of stum they had some obviously they were streaming a lot of their sets on youtube and whatnot for the time being they did some dance things as well but for the most part they kind of kept a low profile kept their heads down and now finally confirmed a slew of dates and the opening dates are mostly going to be a friends and family local affair so the energy is going to be amazing in there in it so I can't wait to see that going forward so definitely a good way to kind of um, start the week especially off the back of the confirmation I think it's going to reopen to have fold back open once again over three days it's going to be an absolute barnstorming affair anyway that's the excellent Music show episode number 475 thanks so much for tuning in it's been a pleasure to absolutely yap your head off for the time being as per usual if it's your first time check out the show make sure you smash the like hit subscribe and leave a comment down below that'd be greatly appreciated if you listen via the podcast that'd be a five star review and a share it obviously help it to go a long way and i'll see you guys again very very soon take care be safe peace